Have you ever been inner tubing behind a speedboat on a lake? I did that a number of times as a kid. We used to call them water biscuits instead of inner tubes, but I did that a couple times as a kid at family reunions and you know, it was family, so no one was trying to hurt anybody, and it was, we were little kids, and that's what I grew up doing, was just being tugged behind a boat, and you, know, you hold on tight, and it kind of bounces a little bit on the water, and it's fun. Then I went in high school with a, a friend, and his dad had a different idea of what fun is when it comes to inner tubing behind a boat. It was his mission, his goal, to get us to fly off in the most violent way possible, uh, my friend, I remember seeing him skipping across the water like a rock. And, uh, you know, he had two inner tubes, and at one point, I was on one, and we were swinging around so fast, my friend went up in the air, and we switched places. His inner tube flew clean over mine, and, you know, he had all these maneuvers. He'd go over the wake of another boat, cross behind it, and he'd start catching air going over the, the wake of another boat, or his favorite was on a corner, you turn and then hit the throttle really hard. So if you're on the inner tube, you get the really swinging motion. You get this lateral G-force. You're hanging on and you're about to fly off. And it was terrifying. Sometimes I imagine that's what our faith is like. We have times in our life where it's turbulent and we're white-knuckled holding on as tight as we can. And this world's doing its best to throw us off. We experience doubts, and I'm going to say that, that we experience doubts. It's not something that lesser Christians experience. It's not something that only young or immature Christians experience, but we all experience some doubts in our life, some doubts about our faith, whether it's about our belief in God or about his attributes, about his love or mercy, whether it's doubting the validity of the Bible or if the church as we know it is really what God intended it to be, we've all been there. In Matthew 28 and verse 17, I love noticing just the, the tiniest little details that, you know, really, if they weren't there, it wouldn't change much about the meaning of the text, but they, the writers of the Bible included them for a reason. In Matthew chapter 28, we almost immediately jump to verse 18 and go to the Great Commission, but I like what it says. If you start in verse 16, we have the 11 disciples, and they proceed to Galilee, to the mountain which Jesus had designated. And so we're talking about the 11, minus Judas, that is. And it says in verse 17, and when they saw him, they worshiped him, but some were doubtful. I wonder if this is an indication that at any given time, those who would be disciples of Christ, that at any given time, those who belong to Christ, there is a number of them that are experiencing doubts. I wonder if that's why that little verse was included, to let us know that even among the disciples at times, there were those who had their doubts and struggled with doubting and trying to work their way through them. Is it wrong to question your beliefs? Is it wrong to entertain questions of doubt? Does that make you a lesser Christian? Is that something you should grow out of and never go through that once you've committed your life to Christ? We have this idea that once we become a Christian, once we're out of the waters of baptism, we should never again struggle with basic questions about our belief. Yet if you're like me, you do from time to time. Is that wrong? What do we do when that happens? Well, first thing I'd like to point out you're in good company. It doesn't make you strange or abnormal as a Christian to every now and then come upon a question that really throws you off track. In fact, we're going to spend some time this morning talking about four people in the Bible that I think we could easily characterize as good, righteous, or heroes in the Bible. We're going to look at four of them. Though there's many more than just these four, I'd like to notice this morning four prominent heroes of the Bible who experienced doubt, experienced some turbulence when it comes to their faith, well, and their trust in God and their beliefs. They were shaken to the core, some of these people. So I want to talk about four of them and how they responded and what we can learn about this. So we're going to begin with Thomas, and we had John chapter 20 read for us just a few moments ago. In John chapter 20, we understand that Jesus first appeared 
to the other disciples, the other apostles, but Thomas was not there. And so in verse 26, John chapter 20, something you, you might not have picked up on, but um, here, here's maybe the root of Thomas's doubt, is that the others got to see the resurrected Savior. But in John chapter 20, notice verse 26. <clears throat> it says, after eight days, again, his disciples were inside, and Thomas was with them this time. They came and told Thomas, you won't believe this. And apparently he didn't. Jesus is risen from the dead. Our master, he's, he's alive. Thomas had an entire week. He had an entire week for that to set in, to think about that, to turn that over and over again in his mind, to let it gnaw at him. That's plenty of time to think about something to the point where he, he cultivated this doubt. But I want to say a few things to Thomas's credit. I, I genuinely think of the four people we're going to look at today, and I think of everybody in the Bible for that matter. Thomas is one of the more relatable characters we encounter because we're in the same boat as Thomas, at least before he saw Jesus. We just have the testimony of what other people have told us. How often have we experienced the same level of doubt? How often do we encounter this type of attitude in others? I want some proof. I want you to prove to me that God created everything. I want you to prove to me that Jesus is the Son of God. I want you to prove to me that there is a heaven and hell awaiting us at the end of this life. I want some proof before I commit to believing. We all want proof but we'll have to settle for evidence. And I think convincing evidence, but we've all been there with Thomas. We've all struggled with the idea of, can I really believe the testimony of others if I haven't seen it for myself? We've all wrestled with this, right? At some point in our lives, maybe before we were Christian, maybe some of us after we were Christian, we started to doubt. Maybe we just grew up in the church and always took it for granted. And as we got older, we started to think, do I really believe this, or is this just what I've been taught? We've all wrestled with these same kind of questions. So I think he's really a relatable person. It's a, it's a similar temptation to want to demand proof like Thomas did. And as we're going to see, if you go back to John chapter 20, as we're going to see with each of these four, I'm going to call this a soft rebuke. It's as if each of these four examples, you know, God's response to them is, you could have done better, but it's okay. You're human. This is common for a common experience among humans. It's a soft rebuke. It's saying, yeah, you could have done better, but learn your lesson and move on. Here's what you need. And so in John chapter 20, we notice Jesus' response in verse 27. Thomas, reach here your finger and see my hands, and reach here your hand and put into my side, and be not unbelieving, but believing. And Thomas answered and said to him, My Lord and my God. And there's an exclamation mark in my Bible, so I imagine that was very emphatic the way he said it. His faith ended up strengthened through this process. I want you to remember that. But again, in verse 29, Jesus says, Because you have seen me, have you believed? Blessed are they who did not see me and yet believed. That's us. That's us. We don't get to see Jesus. We don't get what Thomas eventually had the benefit of. We don't get to see Jesus resurrected and, and see the scars in his hands or the wound in his side. We don't get that. Yet Jesus is still saying, blessed are they who believe without seeing. We have evidence, and there's enough evidence, I think, to be convicted and convinced, fully convinced in my mind. But at times we are going to ask those questions. One distinction we need to make in Thomas' story is, though, Thomas really was a doubter. He really had his doubts. And when you look it up by definition, it means you're uncertain. You're undecided. And that's Thomas. Thomas is still there. He's not looking for an excuse. And that's the difference between someone who doubts and someone who is an unbeliever. The difference between doubt and unbelief is that someone who's in a state of unbelief they don't want the truth. They're looking for an excuse. That's the Pharisees and the Sadducees who 
question Jesus to trap him. Who, when they saw miracles, their response was, how can we kill him? Nothing was going to change their mind. They were closed-minded. The decision was already made. And so they, they weren't asking questions because they had a genuine interest in the answer. They were looking for a way out. And so we need to be careful. Doubting is not in and of itself an unforgivable sin for a Christian. Especially when it has the same result as Thomas. When it results in a stronger faith. But unbelief. And you see that sometimes. You see a lot of people in the world that they ask questions about evolution or they ask questions about the validity of the Bible and they're not looking for the truth. They're not trying to get to the bottom of things. They're just trying to find an excuse so that they can say with a clean conscience, I don't have to believe in the Bible. I have to do what God tells me to. That's the difference between someone who doubts and someone who is caught in unbelief. Unbelief is a willful refusal to believe regardless of the evidence. And so Thomas is definitely a doubter. And we find ourselves in that exact same position sometimes. Admit it. There have been times where you thought, I, I just, I want proof. I want proof. But we're not going to get it. God isn't going to appear to us face to face like he did to Thomas. And so we have to look at the evidence and make our conclusion based upon that. But here's Thomas, one of the disciples, one of the apostles, who for years probably, for a period of a couple years, got to see miracles firsthand and still struggled with the concept. Do you think he was there when Jesus lays, raised Lazarus from the dead? He should have understood the kind of power that Jesus possessed. Yet here he is still doubting. Jesus doesn't condemn him. Jesus doesn't tell him he's a horrible, rotten sinner. He just says, Thomas, did you really need to see? Blessed are those who didn't see and still believe. A soft rebuke, but you see a little bit of understanding and patience on Jesus' part. And I think he has the same attitude towards us today when we struggle with some of these same questions. Patience and understanding, as well as furnishing us the evidence we need if we look for it. If we look for it. And that's critical in understanding how doubts can lead to a good result. Another example, we get two for the price of one here, is Abraham and Sarah. If you go to Genesis chapter 17, uh, we have an example of both of them doubting God because they laughed. They laughed. They chuckled at the idea that God could accomplish what he said he would do. In Genesis chapter 17, beginning in verse 17, Abraham fell on his face and laughed and said in his heart, Will a child be born to a man 100 years old? And will Sarah, who is 90 years old, bear a child? Of course, God's response was, Yes, that's exactly what's going to happen. Ishmael, who you had through Hagar, that's not the child of promise. You're going to have a child through Sarah. It's going to happen. In chapter 18, in verse 10, again, they're reminded of this promise. And he said, I will surely return to you at this time next year. And behold, Sarah, your wife, shall have a son. And Sarah was listening at the tent door, which was behind him. Now Abraham and Sarah were old and advanced in age. Sarah was past childbearing. And Sarah laughed to herself, saying, After I become old, shall I have pleasure, my Lord being old also? And the Lord said to Abraham, Why did Sarah laugh, saying, Shall I indeed bear a child when I am so old? Is anything too difficult for the Lord? At the appointed time, I will return to you at this time next year, and Sarah shall have a son. Sarah denied it, however, saying, I did not laugh, for she was afraid. And he said, No, but you did laugh. <clears throat> and so again, is it wrong? Is it a, a, a sign of, of, of a crumbling faith that you have doubts at times? I think we can easily call Abraham and Sarah pillars of faith. You read all about them in Hebrews chapter 11. We read all about Abraham as the father of faith. In Romans, in James, a lot is spoken of Abraham in the New Testament as still the ultimate example of faith in anyone other than Jesus. Abraham had a great faith, yet here he is 
God can't do this. I'm old. My wife is old. We've tried for decades upon decades and never had kids. It's not going to happen. They both laughed at it. There is a lack of faith. There is a, an element of doubt in Abraham and Sarah that God could actually accomplish this. Yet we know how their story turns out. Far from being a shipwreck for their faith, this actually, it, it turned into a very strong faith. So much so that when we get to Genesis chapter 22, when they actually do have a son, and God tells Abraham to put the son on an altar, put Isaac on an altar and kill him, Abraham is willing to. You read Hebrews chapter 11 that Abraham thought, well, God will keep his promise. Even if I take my son's life as God orders me to, well, God can restore his life. Abraham now understood. He didn't prior to this in Genesis 17, but now he understands what God was telling him. Is there anything too great for me to accomplish? Is there anything that I can't do? And now Abraham understands that. Do you see what happened here? Yes, Abraham had his doubts. But maybe because he experienced a little bit of doubt, it led to a stronger faith in the end, a faith that was strong enough to even sacrifice that son that on many intuitive levels just didn't make sense. Ideally, doubt should move us to a stronger faith. And that's really where we start to understand that doubt, far from being a, a sign of a troubled soul, sometimes is simply an indication of a growing soul. I've heard it said that doubt is the opposite of faith. I rather believe that doubt is one component of a rich and full faith. Not that we're meant to be constantly in a state of doubting or questioning, but that we go through seasons of doubt that hopefully produce in us a stronger faith. Because when we doubt, it causes us to search for answers. It causes us to dig deeper and go deeper into our heart to find those reserves of strength. Can you not see how that can become a good thing for you? if we allow it to. And to tell you the truth, I think God wants a majority of this world to experience a little more doubt. A little more doubt about the church they've chosen. A little more doubt about the book that they choose to call Scripture. A little more doubt about the people that they trust and listen to blindly. A little more doubt about their theories and their reasons for skepticism. I think God wishes more people in the world experienced a little bit of doubt if it would lead them to ask questions and seek for answers that maybe they aren't right now. I'd rather go through times of doubt. It's no fun. It's not fun to struggle, to have a crisis of faith, so to speak. But I'd rather experience those from time to time and come out the other end stronger than to be complacent and just assume I already know everything. Another example is John the Baptist in Matthew chapter 11. And so again, I want you to see if you're maybe right now struggling with some questions about your faith, questions where the answer seems to elude you, where you're struggling to really believe everything about God. Just remember, one of the apostles, the father of faith, Jesus' own cousin, the forerunner, you're in good company. Matthew chapter 11. And the first thing I want to point out is in verse 2. Matthew chapter 11 and verse 2. It says, Now when John was in prison and he heard of the works of Christ, he sent word by his disciples. We just want to notice that John is in prison and how often it is that doubt hits us when the chips are down. When circumstances are bad, we begin to doubt. And I just, I can't help but notice a correlation there that, you know, John is in prison. I wonder if that contributed to the fact that he's starting to question. Jesus of Nazareth, is he really the one? Or is he just one? And there's, you know, the real one is coming after him. And that's what he sends his disciples for in verse 3. He says, go and ask this of Jesus. Are you the expected one or shall we look for someone else? Is there another one coming after you? 
And Jesus' answer is, it's, it's a, it might seem like a strange answer at first. Um, <clears throat> very interesting for sure. Jesus says in verse 4, Go and report to John what you hear and see. The blind receive sight, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, and the deaf hear. And the dead are raised up, and the poor have the gospel preached to them. And blessed is he who keeps from stumbling over me. Again, maybe that last verse is a, like I said before, a soft rebuke. But Jesus' answer is really just providing a little bit of evidence. He provides the evidence that John had already seen, but he allows the ultimate conclusion to be left up to John. He says, what do you think? There's really one inescapable conclusion. But he says, John, you've got to arrive at that yourself. John, what do you think the answer to your question is? Prophecies are being fulfilled left and right. The gospel is being preached. The sick are being healed. The blind are giving back their sight. This is all fulfillment of everything the Old Testament said. So, John, what do you think? Do you think I'm the one? He provides for him the evidence and allows John to make the final conclusion. But really, there's only one inescapable conclusion. Yes, and again, in this example, what we learn is how to deal with those questions of doubt. Search for the answers. And this is what I say to John's credit. Again, he's not caught in unbelief to the point where he's just looking for an excuse to say, look, I'm suffering here, so if you're not the one, then I I'm free to go. You know, I don't, I don't have to suffer for you anymore if you're not the one. He's not an unbelief. He's not an unbeliever looking for an excuse to get out. He's a real believer. He has faith, but he's just struggling with being fully convinced. And so what does he do? Again, to his credit, he looked for the answer. So when you're struggling, when you encounter something, a, a roadblock, uh, a mental block, something, a question, maybe about the nature of God, or you hear a lot of clever scientific explanations about evolution and where this world came from. Maybe you're wrestling with something like that. Try to find the answers. Go and search. In Matthew chapter 7, this is exactly what Jesus told us to do, and he promises us he rewards those who search. Matthew chapter 7 and verse 7, Ask, and it shall be given to you. Seek, and you shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, and he who seeks finds. And to him who knocks, it shall be opened. Or what man is there among you when his son shall ask him for a loaf, will give him a stone? Or if he shall ask for a fish, will he not give him a snake? Or he will not give him a snake, will he? If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more shall your Father, who is in heaven, give what is good to those who ask him? We're told if we look for the truth, if we seek, if we ask, if we seek, if we knock, we'll find what we're looking for. And so that's what John did right. Rather than just let this eat away at him, rather than just doubt and doubt to the point where he gives up in despair, he says, I, I feel like he's the right one, but I need to know. I want to ask him. So he went to the source, looked for the answers. Jesus gave him the evidence that hopefully led him to the right conclusion. And that's, that's all you and I have to do. That's all we can do, is we look and search. And again, like Thomas, Jesus isn't going to appear to us face to face, but if we look, we'll be given the evidence we need. We'll find in here. Enough evidence to convict our conscience. Enough evidence to believe and stand on firm ground. But we have to search for it. And remember, 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 4, just remember this, that in the search for knowledge and understanding, in the search for answers to questions that are bothering us, God is on your side. We just read that he promised us, if you search, you'll find. In 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 4, <clears throat> 
Wrong verse. Gets you every time. Nope, I tried that in my mind. I said, is it 1 Timothy 4.2? Is it Timothy 2.4? Nope. This one's going to bother me for a long time now. Well, in Matthew 7, that's the promise Jesus makes to us. If you ask, if you search, you're going to find. And fourthly, Habakkuk. I'll give you a minute to find it in your Old Testament, but I'll bet you Habakkuk was not who you'd think would be the fourth and final on my list. Habakkuk chapter 1. What I was looking for when I was thinking about, you know, which four people should I include? I wanted to find three or four. I didn't want too many. So I wanted three or four of them, and I tried to think, who are the ones we can relate to most? Who are the most relatable? And again, I think they all struggled with very similar things that you and I might struggle with today. With Thomas, it was wanting proof. It was struggling with, can I believe the testimony of others? And that, everyone questions that today. With Abraham and Sarah, it's questioning the power of God. Uh, I mean, God says he can change my life and transform me. I, can you really do that, God? Well, is there anything too great that I can't do it? Is there anything beyond my ability to accomplish, God says? With John the Baptist, it's that idea of being fully convinced that, that John was a believer, but he wanted he sought for the answers. With Habakkuk, it's wrestling with God's nature, with his judgments, with his righteousness. Habakkuk chapter 1, it says in verse 2, How long, O Lord, will I call for help, and thou wilt not hear? I cry out to thee violence, yet thou dost not save. Why dost thou make me see iniquity and cause me to look on wickedness? Yes, destruction and violence are before me. Strife exists and contention arises. Therefore the law is ignored and justice is never upheld. For the wicked surround the righteous. Therefore justice comes out perverted. He says, God, why is everything so messed up right now? Why is nobody doing the right things? Why are you allowing wickedness to exist? And furthermore, he's going to wrestle with the idea of God's justice. Because he says in verse 5, God responds to him, look among the nations and observe, be astonished, wonder, because I'm doing something in your days you would not believe if you were told. For behold, I am raising up the Chaldeans. God says, the Chaldeans, I'm going to use them. To punish. I'm going to use them to punish the wicked doers, the wrongdoers. And Habakkuk says, hold on, God. But they're wicked too. How can you use? And there's that question. How can a just God? You ever heard somebody ask you a question like that? How can a just and loving God, insert whatever question, how could a just and loving God possibly condemn people to hell forever? People wrestle with God's morality, his justice, his wisdom, his nature. Habakkuk chapter 1 and verse 12. Art thou not from everlasting, O Lord, my God, my Holy One? We will not die. Thou, O Lord, hast appointed them to judge. And thou, O Rock, hast established them to correct. Thine eyes are too pure to approve evil. And thou canst not look on wickedness with favor. Why dost thou look with favor on those who deal treacherously? Why art thou silent when the wicked swallow up those more righteous than they? God, how, how can you do this? How can you use such a wicked people to punish people less wicked than them? He doesn't understand how this, from a moral standpoint, makes sense. He's legitimately struggling. Again, he's not caught in unbelief looking for a way out. 
He's just trying to make sense of it. And I think really struggling with this. King David chronicled a similar experience in his life when he wrote Psalm 73. It bothered David. If you go to Psalm 73, it, it genuinely bothered David when he considered the different fates, the opposing fates of the wicked and the righteous, that he looked around and saw wicked people who were prospering. He says, God, where are you? Punish them. And he saw that there were good and righteous people, and he, I think, put himself in that category. And he said, I'm suffering, and there are righteous people who are doing good, and they're suffering. God, why, why is this happening? Psalm 73 uh, it says in verse 16, When I pondered to understand this, it was troublesome in my sight. And that really is the nature. James chapter 1 and verse 6 talks about the one who doubts is like the surf of the sea, constantly churning, no rest, no peace. And that's what happens. That's why I told you before that doubt can be a good thing when it produces a stronger faith. When doubt leads us to seek for truth and answers, we dig deeper into the text, we go deeper into our heart, we find a deeper level of commitment. Doubt can be a good thing, but only in small amounts, really. We weren't meant to live like this because it is, by its very nature, uncomfortable, painful, depressing. Uh, a psychology term is cognitive dissonance when you have two opposing views, and you, you can't reconcile them. It just, nothing functions right until you can resolve what's bothering your conscience or, or what, is, what, what, what questions you cannot find resolution to. And, and that's really what's being described here. Habakkuk is bothered by this. David says, when I pondered this, it troubled me. I bet David lost sleep over this. Doubt, by its very nature, produces discomfort. But we have a good ending to these stories here because in David's case, if you're still in Psalm 73, look at verse 17 now. It said, when I thought about this, when I tried to understand it, it, it was troublesome in my sight until I came into the sanctuary of God. Then I perceived their end. Then he begins to understand. If I look at it from the big picture, yeah, they might get away with some wickedness in life and not be punished, but it won't escape the eyes of God. And in the big picture, justice will be done. Maybe not right here and right now the way I want it to, but David said, I finally understood this. Can you see how this progression worked in David's favor and how doubts can work to your favor if you allow them to push you closer to God? That's what I get here. It troubled him in verse 16, but in verse 17 he says, until I came to the sanctuary of God. It seems like this bothered David and it troubled him and it pushed him closer to God. In searching for his answers and searching for resolution and peace, he turned to God. And then he found peace. He understood. It made sense. It wasn't troubling him anymore. And the same is true of Habakkuk. Let's go back to Habakkuk chapter 3. Beautiful prayer. When I often think about a target, where do I want to be as far as my faith is concerned? I want to be like Habakkuk here in chapter 3. This is a prayer of Habakkuk. <clears throat> he now understands God is just. God might use, as he did the Assyrians to destroy the northern kingdom of Israel, as he used the Babylonians to destroy the southern kingdom. God might use a wicked people to do his will, but that doesn't mean the wicked people are, are, are okay in the eyes of God. They'll still be punished. They'll still be dealt with. He understands that God is just, he understands that this is happening and nothing can stop it at this point. And so now he just has to wait. He has to wait for these terrible, terrifying, horrible, wicked people to come and destroy his home. He knows it's coming. But he found peace with God. Habakkuk chapter 3, if you start in verse 16, I heard and my inward parts trembled. At the sound my lips quivered. Decay enters my bones, and in my place I tremble. 
because I must wait quietly for the day of distress, for the people to arise who will invade us. Though the fig tree should not blossom and there be no fruit on the vines, though the yield of the olive should fail and the fields produce no food, though the flock should be cut off from the fold and there be no cattle in the stalls, yet I will exult in the Lord. I will rejoice in the God of my salvation. The Lord God is my strength. It says no matter what happens, no matter what calamity, how everything around me falls apart, I'll cling to God because he is my strength. And it will be okay. We're not meant to live in doubt. And honestly, continuing in doubt is the worst thing you can do because when you have unresolved questions, it eats away at you. And it'll eat away at you and continue to do so until you are empty. And when you feel empty inside... You're vulnerable to Satan. Satan is looking for people who are empty vessels, for people that are feeling distraught. So don't let it eat away at you. In each of these four examples, their doubting ultimately resulted in a stronger version of themselves. We don't rejoice when we go through doubts. We don't cheer that, hey, I'm struggling with something right now. But we also understand that it's part of the growth process that if we use our doubts to push us in the direction of drawing near to God, digging deeper in His Word, searching for those answers, it can produce a stronger version of ourselves. It can be very beneficial. So my advice to you, if you're one right now hearing this lesson, struggling with a question, struggling with your foundational beliefs, do I believe in God? Do I believe in the Bible? Do I believe that this is the right church questions like that my advice to you is search ask seek knock just like john the baptist he wasn't sure so he thought i'm going to ask i'm going to look for the answers i'm going to ask the questions search study read the bible dig deep into the scriptures and look for your answers seek the help of those around you someone you trust someone who is wise If you come to me saying you're struggling, I'm not going to judge you. I'm not going to condemn you. I'm not going to say, well, that's pathetic. I'm going to say, I've been there too, more recently than you might think or might surprise you. Let's find some answers together. And utilize prayer and meditation. Those are a few things that might help you. Ultimately, I think we're like that father in Mark chapter 9, and I think this is what God wants. In each of these four examples, their doubting resulted in stronger faith, and God responded to them with patience, with love, and with furnishing them what they needed. I think God is pleased that in our doubts, when we have this type of attitude, I believe, but help my unbelief. I'm struggling, but I don't want to quit. I don't want to give up. This is when we need to white knuckles, grab on tight, and hold on to our faith and not let it go. It's a struggle. But we need to hold on tight and look for answers and turn to God. So if you're one this morning who is struggling, looking for answers, needing help, I'm here if you want to talk to me at some point. We're here as your brethren if you want to come forward this very morning and and seek for help and encouragement. We invite you to come forward now as we stand and sing.